Uh, yeah. I, I'm firmly anti knife and fork pizza. Um, <laughs> that's yeah. Thank you so much for being here. My Thank pleasure. You Thank you for having me. Show up any place there's pizza. It's pretty easy. <sighs> it's very true. It's very true. <laughs> yeah, um, just to start off, what has your career been like in public service and what kind of made you choose that path? Oh my goodness. I'll take the second part first, okay. if that's okay. It's a big question, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a big question. So I grew up in a small town in rural Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. um, town of 5,000 people, biggest town in the county, you know, across from a cornfield next to a dairy farm. And my grandmother, who didn't live in our town but lived close by, um, you know, she was born before women had the right to vote. Mm -hmm. She went on to have this incredible military career, actually. She was the wow. chief nurse of uh, an evacuation hospital in World War II. So this hospital, 2,000 beds, just a few miles from the front lines, following the fighting around from Italy and into Germany, or Italy, then France, and into Germany. And then she got back from the war, and she married my grandfather, and she was expected to never work outside the home again, right? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of maddening to think about now. Like someone who had that talent, right, that management skill, that ability to handle a crisis, to deal with all of those beds, all of those nurses, mm -hmm. with like bombs dropping and guns going off just down the road, never was able to pursue a career if that had been what she wanted to do. But she took all of that energy and she funneled it into me and to my brother and to our cousin and was adamant about the fact that we had to be problem solvers, right? Like, it didn't mean we had to run for office. I'm the only person in my family who's ever run for office, trust me. <laughs> like, I am, the, for many reasons, the, the weirdo in my family, <laughs> uh, this being the least of it. But, you know, she was really, really clear that you have to take whatever talents and interests you have and use it in service of other people. Mm -hmm. And that's what my entire career has been about. I mean, quite frankly, Every job I've taken has just felt like an extension I start of an extension of a conversation I started with my grandmother when I was a little girl. Um, even though she's been gone now for it'll be 18 years this fall, um, it all just feels like a continuation of something that we started. So, you know, I moved up here to go to college and started working in nonprofit campaigns, public service right away. I've never had a for-profit job. I've built this career that's really been entirely focused on how you create a fair economy, how you lift people up, invest in other people. Um, but the only reason I got into any of this in the first place is because I had this awesome grandma who decided like, I'm gonna make sure you understand that you've gotta use your powers for good. It's yeah. awesome. It's awesome. I think you mentioned your time in the select board a little. Yeah. We were kind of wondering, you know, for people who may not know, what is a select board and why did you decide to run? That is a great question. Uh, I think for people outside of New England, the only reason you may have heard of, of a select board or selectman is because of Gilmore Girls, right? <laughs> that is the only relevant uh, uh, entertainment <laughs> reference point. Um, but in a lot of communities, including Wellesley, there, instead of a mayor and a city council, you have a select board or a board of selectmen. A lot of them are starting to change to the gender neutral select board, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and town meeting. So in Brookline, you have five members of the select board and 240 plus members of town meeting. So think of the select board as the executive branch of town government just split amongst five people. So uh, think of it that I was 20% of the mayor of Brookline. <laughs> it's not exactly logical, but it's how we got things done. Um, and then the legislative branch is town meeting. Uh, all volunteers, 16 different precincts in Brookline, 15 town meeting members per precinct, plus a host of ex officio folks. Uh, and they vote on the budget, zoning changes, things like that coming together usually twice a year. Uh, and the select board meets every Tuesday night for many, many hours on end to handle the uh, you know, more day-to-day -day business of the town. But it's almost like superheroes, right? Like our powers combine, we are a mayor. Why did you choose to run for a select board? And then later, why did you choose to run for Congress? Oh, so I have to tell you, I was running the Mass Women's Political Caucus, you know, and my literal job was to run around the state and to say to women, particularly young women, like, hey, when there's an opening in your own backyard, you have to go yeah. for it. The boys mm -hmm. don't wait. And I was really involved in local politics. I'd been a town meeting member. I was a library trustee, which we elect in Brookline. I was on the Democratic Town Committee. I chaired the progressive sort of political group in town. And there were a bunch of us a few months before Election Day who were sitting around talking about who we could get to run for the select board. There was going to be a vacancy. 
and you know maybe a half dozen of us and describing the characteristics and what we were looking for and finally this you know probably 50 something year old guy who had been on the select board before turns and looks at me and says Jesse you know we're talking about you right and I was just like I'm a giant hypocrite. I'm, I'm literally running around asking all of these other women to like stick their necks out, go for it. And I didn't even realize that I had that own chance to step up in my own community where I was like putting down roots and developing a track record. And so um, as soon as I sort of got smacked in the face with that hypocrisy, I was like, no, you're right. You're right. Like I have to um, walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Um, and so I went for it and lost. So I, I ran in 2006 and it was a five-way race for two spots. I came in third uh, in a very, very close election. And then the next year, there was also a vacancy in Brookline. There are elections every May, um, as there are in so many communities. There was another vacancy and Quite frankly, I was still exhausted from the previous year. I'd sort of thought I would run again at some point. I'd had joined, I had enjoyed the experience, but it was a lot and I was working full time and also trying to have a little bit of a social life because I was in my 20s. Yeah. And, um, but the opportunity came up and you don't get to pick that. So I ran again and I won with 65% of the vote and was 27, the youngest person ever elected to the select board in the 300 plus year history of the town. So, you know, um, now, let's see, it's 14 years since the first time I ran for the select board, and I've gotten a little more comfortable <laughs> with putting myself out there, which happens as you, you know, have experiences and get a little older. Um, but, you know, I've been working on all of these things around creating a fair economy for almost 20 years now, and it's the stuff that I wish was coming out of Washington. For the seat to open up and for my background to really speak to what I had been hoping for out of Washington all of these years. It just felt like, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I've got to step up and swing at the pitch. And I also knew my grandmother would expect me to do it. So here we are. That's awesome. awesome. Um, going back a little, yeah. uh, you also said like you worked as a communications director for mm -hmm. Governor Deval Patrick. What was that like? Like, what did you do? What did you learn about government? Oh, at man. Level? That was like drinking from four fire hoses at <laughs> You know, it's literally the first day that I was there um, in January of 2013, uh, the governor announced a huge transportation proposal that they'd been working on for months. Um, and it snowballed from there. Like a week or two later was the State of the Commonwealth address where he announced a new big tax package. And, you know, I was just trying to find out, like, where the bathroom was in the <laughs> office. But you have to learn all of these acronyms. You have to learn uh, who the right people are to connect reporters or other staffers with when they have questions. You know, the communications director is really the head of all of the strategic comms coming out of the governor's office. So we have our own press team. In, they call it 360. And actually, the governor's office in 360 with our press secretary, deputy press secretaries, um, you know, assistants, interns, photographer, all of that. But then all eight secretaries have their own versions of that. And the secretaries that then have big agencies <laughs> under them, they also have oh their own God. versions of that. So our job is really to be the conductor um, when you're in the governor's office of all of that and make sure that, you know, if the Department of Transportation wants to make a big announcement on Tuesday, that it's not stepping on the toes of a big announcement from you know, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. Not that they both aren't important things that we need to announce, but they would have no idea that this other announcement is coming. And so we've got to um, sort of be the conductor of the orchestra and make sure all of that's happening. Come out with a master plan for communications and where we want things to go, and then fully realize that that is 100% guaranteed to change, <laughs> right? Something will happen, whether it's something big and serious like the marathon bombing, um, that took us in a totally different direction for weeks and weeks and weeks um, from what we had been planning on working on that April to, you know, a snowstorm, something that's serious but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, much more manageable and will only, you know, take you off course for a few days. So you come up with the plan, you do your best, uh, and then you just try and herd all the cats <laughs> and make it work. But... It was an incredible opportunity to be able to look at the entire scope of state government 
um, and really get an understanding of what all these different agencies, big and small, work on and the way that really intersects with the public and hopefully helping people. Um, and in working with the public as communications director, um, I imagine that you'd have like some experiences with people in the public like, having misconceptions about government. Um, yeah. So what would you say is the biggest misconception about government that the public Oh, know? man. I mean, there are a lot of misconceptions <laughs> about government. I, I would say the biggest one is people think that the outcome is already baked, right? That it's predetermined and that, you know, one voice doesn't matter or the voice of community activists doesn't matter because those folks in back rooms have already figured out what's going to happen. And we've seen so many times, particularly these past few years after the election, in 2016 that that just isn't always the case. I mean, healthcare reform, Obamacare was really in jeopardy just a few years ago and it was members of the public, people with incredibly powerful personal stories about what Obamacare has meant to their own access to healthcare um, who really just stormed Capitol Hill either figuratively or literally with those stories and insisted that their representatives really represent their needs and their concerns and wound up saving Obamacare. So um, I know it's easy to be cynical about the process. I know it's so easy to think um, that things are just being done in back rooms and that the public has no say, but um, it really isn't the case. I mean, just down the road in Newton um, around uh, affordable housing last week, right? The public rallied and stepped up around this ballot question to make sure that a project that's going to make Newton so much more accessible for people of more diverse economic backgrounds, that was the public weighing in and making sure that that is going to move forward. So um, yeah, the, the cynicism and the, the frustration are real, but it can never be cause for walking away from the process. And you touched on this before, but yeah. what would you say is the most rewarding part of being a public citizen? Oh, that is an incredibly easy question to answer, and I'll give you an example. Um, when I first got elected to the board in Brookline, you know, you get all these calls from constituents who want things or need things, and some of them are big and take a long time, and others are, you know, I having a tough time getting the permit for whatever. And so I got a call like that, a guy who wanted to talk about his permit, and he had a peddler's license. You know, the guys who, like, on Marathon Monday are outside yeah. selling SpongeBob right. SquarePants balloons on a stick? <laughs> yeah. Um, that. <laughs> and quite frankly, like, I put it in my to-do list, and I didn't think much about it, and it turns out that he was having trouble renewing his peddler's license because he had a bunch of parking tickets. And he was an elderly gentleman on fixed income, and the few thousand bucks he earned every year from selling those SpongeBob SquarePants balloons were, was really important to supplementing his income, right? And so I called the police chief and we were able to work out that, um, you know, he confirmed that he didn't have any serious violations. They were just parking tickets that hadn't been paid. He put him on a payment plan. As long as he stuck with it, he would get his license back, you know, with that provision. Great, super happy, I call the guy back. I tell him, I cross it off my to-do list, I go on my merry way, and I didn't give it a second thought. And then a week or so later, my doorbell rings, and it's that man with a plant. You know, on his incredibly fixed income, he had gone to Stop and Shop, and he had picked up a plant for me and brought it to my house to say thank you. And it was the loveliest thing, but also like the most important lesson for me to learn very, very early in my career in public service that these things that feel like just an item on your to-do list that you've got to check off and move along are incredibly important to the daily lives of people. And that by far has been the most rewarding piece of this. And getting able to being able to see time and time again that like I love the big policy stuff and I'm as yeah. nerdy as they come and it's <laughs> great. But you know, with five minutes worth of my time and a call to the chief, I was able to make sure that this guy had economic stability, right? And that's huge. And the reward that I get from that, just, you know, the warm fuzzies inside, you can't match it. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And um, the plant was lovely. We really appreciate you being coming out here. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Why do you think that students should take time out of their schedules to get involved in government? Oh, because we are screwed without you. <laughs> I mean, it's like not more complicated than that. Walk into any campaign office, issue, candidate, you name it. It's young people, high school students and college students who are doing 
the work. I mean, you guys are the ones who are who are phone banking, who are canvassing, who are text banking, who are out there doing the actual work. I mean, we've seen more now than in generations that it's high school students who are coming up with the big, bold, forward-thinking policy ideas that we need to save the planet and to keep all of us safe. I mean, I, I don't want to think about what the 2020 elections and beyond would look like without high school students. So. Um, I hope that you and all of your friends and everyone watching, hi, um, have a plan to vote this fall. But even beyond that, have a plan to engage, to pick a candidate you like and volunteer for them, to go work for the Environmental Voter Project, this awesome nonprofit that's working to get pro-environment voters out to the polls. Go work you know, for the uh, election project at Planned Parenthood. Whatever blows your hair back, we are literally screwed without all of you. So that is why it's important. We need you to basically save us. All right, well, thank you so much for being here on Pizza and Politics. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for the food. Enjoy Great to meet you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>